Today, more info about Naz, Daz, Raids, and Sands than you ever wanted to know. Hold tight. I'm John P, and this is Geek Beat. And here we go. Today's episode of Geek Beat is brought to you by Lumosity. You guys have been hammering me lately with questions about Drobos and QNAPs and storage in general, so today's episode is dedicated to nothing but a discussion of all the options and when they make most sense. But first, let's get a feel for the kind of questions you've been sending in. From Mike Hamilton, he suggested on Patreon that I actually do this show. Just wondering, which do you prefer, Drobo or QNAP devices? I was looking for a Drobo device for home, but QNAP looks good too. Wonder if you can compare the two and functions and specs of the different devices. Chris Kirby on Twitter, John Pose. Have the original Drobo, looking to upgrade, but data is not directly transferable. Wondering if this is time to make changes. John over on Google Plus, do you recommend a QNAP 4 or 5 bays or a Drobo 5N for a home photo video editing from the NAS drive? Peter over on the Geek Beat blog said, great info on the drives, but I need more NAS info as I'm planning to buy one. Nick over on Twitter said, hey, QNAP and Drobo both have off-site automated duplication, right? Do they integrate things like Dropbox? Jamie over on Twitter, John Pose just watched NAS Drive Vid. What product would you recommend? QNAP Synology, where data backup is the main function. And of course, there were many more. Plus, we just had a big discussion with a group of the Geek Beat patrons on our monthly hangout about this. So, I'm going to answer all the questions for you guys once and for all. Which is better, Drobo or QNAP? Scratch that. Both Drobo and QNAP have sponsored GeekBeat, and I know we all appreciate that, but we don't need anyone getting mad at me for only talking about them. So, I'm also going to talk about a few other brands and types of storage, okay? And I don't want to hear any crap about bias, because I'm telling you things I know based on first-hand usage of these drives. See, they're right here. Every one of them, I've touched them, played with them. So... Get some popcorn or whatever you do, because it's going to be a long discussion today. First, we need to acknowledge that no one storage device is going to be perfect for all situations. In fact, for every single unit I'm about to recommend, I could spend an equal amount of time ripping at a new one for all the things it can't do. There are compromises in life, and storage is no exception. So the first thing we need to do is segment our discussion into two categories. Direct attached storage and network attached storage. Direct attached means we're hooking it directly to a computer with a Firewire, USB, or Thunderbolt cable to be used with a single machine. Network attached storage means the storage connects via ethernet into a router so it can be shared with multiple computers. Now let's talk about direct attached storage first. Some of you have asked me about very specific applications such as video editing and photo storage and editing directly from your external storage. If that's your primary application, you're almost always going to benefit from connecting to the drive with USB 3 or Thunderbolt versus Ethernet. The good news is that you'll get speeds that are at least 300% faster. But the bad news is the storage will only hook up to a single device. Now, I've had a lot of first-hand experience using three different drives of this type. The Drobo 5D is a five-drive bay unit that has both Thunderbolt and USB 3 connections. It also holds an mSATA SSD for data acceleration, and when you connect your computer to it, it can achieve hundreds of megabytes per second of throughput. So, it's as fast as your internal drive and often even faster. This is what you need if you're going to try to manipulate lots of little files like a photo collection for sure. And even with large videos, you're going to want that speed. Considering you can load a Drobo 5D with up to four ter you know, five 4 terabyte drives for 20 terabytes of raw capacity and you can set it up to have dual drive redundancy, its combination of storage, speed, reliability, and price is hard to beat. But that's not your only option. I've also had fantastic results with the GTEC Thunderbolt RAID drives. 
For example, you can get a four terabyte unit for about $600 that's blazingly fast. That's because it uses RAID 0 to maximize speed, though it does so at the cost of redundancy. The GTEC drive would be great if you're looking for a lot of raw, fast external storage to work on, but not for long-term storage. It's faster and cheaper than the Drobo, but lacks the aggregate storage capacity and the multiple levels of data protection, combined with the ability to swap out failed drives on the fly. If you're wanting big storage on the go, I've got two recommendations. First, for the most capacity you can get in a compact to go unit, the Drobo Mini will let you combine four two and a half inch drives into a single redundant M SATA accelerated Thunderbolt portable drive. It has no competition. If you can't afford something quite that big or you won't be near a wall outlet because it needs power, I recommend the rugged Lacy drives. The one to two terabyte drives have performed great for me for years, and for the ultra paranoid, get two, and when you copy important data to one, mirror it onto the other. So you always have two independent copies in case something happens to one. Okay, so now it's time to switch to a discussion about network attached storage. But not until after this commercial break. <laughs> I always wanted to do that one day. Ooh, I hate it when they break in with a commercial right when you're ready to get to the good stuff. But you gotta admit that was a good teaser to make sure you don't all leave while I tell you about Lumosity, right? Besides, Lumosity is cool. It's not really like a commercial anyway. Listen, if you haven't given it a try yet, be good to your brain and to GeekBeat. Just pop on over to lumosity.com forward slash GeekBeat Lumosity is a site that's designed to train your brain. It'll give you measurable results and you can actually feel yourself getting smarter. That's because they've combined a bunch of fun games with a bunch of secret neuroscientistic research, which results in you having faster responses and better memory. And I'm pretty sure it makes you taller and better looking. Yeah, I can vouch for that. So head on over to lumosity.com forward slash geekbeat and sign up for your free account. If you don't like it, I'll personally refund all the money you didn't have to pay to give it a try. Okay, that should be enough direct attached storage options for pretty much everyone. So let's move on to NAS or network attached storage. If your goal is to put your files on the network so multiple computers can share them, this is the way to go. To me, the ideal size for a NAS device is at least four drives. You can get them with as few as two if you're gonna really never use much storage. And if you're gonna do that, I've got a recommendation for you in a minute, but with four or more, you can have plenty of space without sacrificing redundancy. And I've got three different options for you here. The QNAP TS470, the Synology 1513, and the Drobo 5N. I'm gonna make it really simple for you to know if you need a Drobo or if you'd be better off with a QNAP or Synology. If all you really care about is a place to store your backups and movies and music, and you're looking for a machine that requires absolutely no work or thinking about anything, the Drobo is your best option. Drobos let you literally just plug in bare hard drives and walk away. So the big benefit is ease of use. The Drobo 5N is at $500, a cheaper and simpler, though it's slower and less powerful than the competition. Drobo also offers a small number of apps that you can run, most importantly, Plex, which lets you stream your media to TVs or mobile devices anywhere in the world. But it also lets you mirror your content to either copy.com or Elephant Drive. The bad news is, if you wanted to mirror several terabytes of data, it would cost you a few thousand dollars per month. But hey, you can at least mirror your most important files to the cloud, if not back up all your data. Now, speaking of apps, you'll know you are not a Drobo person if you really want your NAS to act like a little network server. Both Synology and QNAP are gonna allow you to run tons of add-on apps, like an iTunes server, a download station, your own private cloud server, antivirus software, surveillance camera software, time machine backups, and a lot more. We're gonna have a whole series of tutorials about how to set up all these functions, at least on the QNAPs, in the next few weeks, so you can see firsthand how to make all that work. So let's skip to the physical systems for now. 
The Synology over here is going to give you five drive bays plus four gigabit Ethernet ports powered by a dual core 2.1 gigahertz Atom processor and two gig of 1066 RAM for around 800 bucks. That means a lot of storage with good redundancy and good network performance as long as you aren't asking it to do too many things at the same time. The QNAP TS470 is a four drive bay unit with two gig of 1333 RAM and a full blown Intel i3 dual core 3.3 gigahertz processor. It has two gigabit ethernet ports, but you have the option to add two more or two 10 gig E ports. On top of generally having more power and speed than the Synology, it also offers a very unique feature, HDMI, and audio inputs and outputs. This means that the TS470 can play movies and content directly to a TV without needing an Apple TV, Roku, or smart TV functionality. The QNAP also costs around $200 more. So which of these devices should you choose? Well, the Synology costs a couple hundred less, plus lets you add one more drive. So there's a lot more total storage bang for the buck there. Of course, if you really need to store that much data, you might want to move it around quickly. And in that case, you might consider a 10 gig E capable switch for your network, which only the TS470 could ultimately take advantage of if you offer the 10 gig E upgrade. On top of that, if you're in an environment where you need to run a lot of apps, or you're gonna have multiple people doing things simultaneously, especially iSCSI connections, there could end up being a big performance difference, not only from the network connection, but also from the processing capability. For example, if you wanted to transcode and stream multiple videos from the NAS simultaneously, you're gonna have a much better experience when you've got more power to do it. Another time power makes a difference is when you have a hard drive failure. When that happens, and it will, you need to manually switch out the bad drive and tell the machine to rebuild the RAID array, and the QNAP speed is gonna get it done in a fraction of the time. And if you ask me, that's important because you're vulnerable when that rebuild is being done, and it could take literally days. Believe me, you'll be extremely nervous while you're waiting and praying there isn't another drive failure at that time, I know from experience. So if you're gonna have one NAS and you're already spending $1,500 to $2,000 on the chassis plus all the drives, personally, I'd pony up the extra 200 bucks to get the added power and the HDMI functionality. One last thing about the QNAP and Synology devices, they have multiple backup options, including the ability to synchronize themselves with identical units across a network for complete redundancy and the ability to act as private cloud servers. There were several questions about Dropbox integration with the NAS, and I'm sorry to say, but no one supports Dropbox. Having said that, both manufacturers offer their own Dropbox-like private cloud functionality, which allows you to sync files and fol folders on any machine to the NAS server. Though they're all a little buggy, they're getting better and better, and they're a viable alternative if you'd like to move to a privately controlled cloud. All right, we're in the home stretch, but I don't want to stop before we address two special situations. First of all, for people either on a budget or who only want to buy a two bay NAS, because although they want access to all those apps, they aren't really going to store all the much data or have too many people using it at once. If that's the case, for 300 bucks, you can pick up the unique QNAP HS210. It's a fanless design that can live silently right beside your media center and TV and still let you do everything its big, bigger brothers can do. And secondly, no NAS discussion would be complete without mentioning the most disaster-proof server you can get, the IO Safe. We've personally torture tested this little two-bay storage server and I can tell you firsthand that it can survive fire and complete water submersion. So if you have really critical data that you want to ensure, nothing will protect it like an IO safe. You can check out the video and all of the torture tests as well as get links to all the show notes by visiting geekbeat.tv forward slash 788. And I'd recommend you also check out my NAS hard drive recommendation video at geekbeat.tv forward slash 786. Anyway, 
that's it for this episode. Keep in mind that every manufacturer I mentioned makes a lot of other devices that I didn't cover. I only touched on a range of options that seemed logical. So if you have follow-up questions or want to discuss a specific price range or other models, drop them in the comments below or tweet them to me, at John Pose, and I'll get back to you as quick as I can. Hope this helped. Please give us a thumbs up and share this video if you enjoyed it. It sure is going to take Dave a long time to edit this one. Thanks. I'm John P. I'll see you next time.